So this account then that we're looking at this evening, Ananias and Sapphira, is a, a fairly short narrative, as we've just had read, but one that's got uh, a lot of the meaning and, and lessons uh, underneath it. And what we're going to try and cover this evening um, is, firstly, uh, and for probably most of most of this talk, is to consider how this fits within the account of the Acts, and um, within the, the early uh, chapters of Acts. And we're going to compare this record with several, other, several others in Acts. Uh, and see uh, the lessons that come out from that in terms of how the Ecclesia dealt with various situations that they found themselves in um, and take the lessons for us in our day and how we can react to uh, both positive and negative situations. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the particular details within the narrative itself. So firstly then, to consider where this narrative sits within the Acts record. This is, of course, the, the early preaching of, of the gospel after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 1, uh, where Peter is the prominent uh, character, the prominent apostle in these early chapters. And we've had Peter's speech uh, in chapter 2, where... Uh, many thousands were, were baptized and, and converted to, to a knowledge of the truth. And then we come to chapter three, which is where we're really going to begin our thoughts, um, with Peter and John and the healing of the impotent man, the man lame from his mother's womb. Uh, so, so we're going to come back here in a moment, but just to, to build up the context of where we get to Ananias and Sapphira. So Peter and John heal this lame man. Um, and, and the word is again preached on the back of that. And it's at this point that the apostles' preaching faces its first major challenge, when it faces its first period of oppression from the, the uh, priests and the elders of the Jews uh, in chapter 4. So in chapter 4 and verse 2, um, the well, verse one, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Um, and in verse seven, um, they are challenged, the apostles are challenged by what power or by what name have you done this? And through the dialogue that continues, they are commanded in verse 18 of chapter four, um, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. And so this is the first time that the apostles preaching, of course, the Lord Jesus had faced, um, and his, his disciples had faced this kind of challenge while he was with them previously, but this is the first time the Ecclesia, as it had been established, faced this kind of challenge. And their response in verse 19, um, Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you're to you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So the response is that the sight of God is more important than the sight of men. Peter and John say, whatever you tell us to do, we are more interested in what God sees than what you see. And it's important to note that as the context for what um, Ananias and Sapphira go on to do. And in response to this challenge, they first of all, uh, as, uh, as we've said, they continue um, to, to preach and then they use the, uh, to, to obey what they are told to do by the, by the leaders of the day. And then their, their next um, action following this challenge is to pray. Verse 24, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, uh, and then they go on to, um, to make this, this wonderful prayer um, from verse 24 down to verse 30, where they ask for God's help to continue the work of preaching. Um, verse 29, now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness 
they may speak thy word. So their response to this first challenge is to reiterate that they are more bothered by what God sees than what man sees. And then they go to God in prayer. And then the third thing that they do, um, well, well, they continue to, to, to speak boldly, as, as we just mentioned. And then the third thing that they do is this passage that we have at the end of chapter 4, from verse 31 to 37. Um, if I just uh, read, read that passage uh, quickly. Um, so verse, chapter 4, verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And actually, that's as far as we need to read uh, for now. So we, we have this passage here at the, at the end of chapter four, that, that again, in response to the challenge that they faced, they unite the ecclesia in, um, in two ways, both in the belief that they share, they are of one heart and one soul, and also in the support and the love and the care that they show to each other when they um, support each other in the material wealth that, that some of them have. And these words that we have at the end of chapter four, um, before, you, before you worry, it might be a few minutes before we actually get to chapter five and, and Ananias and Sapphira, so don't panic if we get sort of 10 minutes in and we haven't got there yet. Um, but this passage that we have here at the end of chapter four, none of this is new. None of this is, is the first time that this has occurred. In fact, almost all of these words and phrases are lifted almost directly from the end of Acts chapter two. Um, well, from, from the beginning and end of Acts chapter two. So if we just compare these two passages for, for, for a moment, in Acts chapter 2, um, at the start of the chapter, um, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Well, that's exactly what we've just read uh, in Acts 4, um, in verse uh, 24, this prayer that they offer, they lift up their voice to God with one accord. And then when they unite themselves again at the end of the chapter in verse 32, um, verse 31, sorry, they were all assembled together. And then verse 32, they were of one heart and of one soul. Uh, Acts chapter 2, of course, was the occasion when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, when, when the tongues of fire um, came upon them. And again, this is the second time now, um, in chapter 4, verse 31, that they are all filled with the Holy Spirit. And the, the uh, consequence of the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit gift that they were given at that time was very similar. Um, in chapter 2, verse 4, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now in chapter 4, verse 31, when they are all filled with the Holy Spirit, they spake the word of God with boldness. The words that they speak in Acts chapter 2, um, and Peter in particular, when we come to the end of the chapter, there was, uh, verse 41, there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. And in verse 32, we have the multitude of them that believed. Um, signs and wonders are done in Acts 2, verse 43. Many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And that is exactly what they prayed for. Um, in verse 30 of chapter 4, that signs and wonders might be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Fear comes upon the ecclesia, and that comes up actually at the end of our account in, in chapter 5 and verse 11. And then we get the, the, the real 
the broad similarities, I think, where it is even closer to being word for word. Um, so in chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, if I just read these verses, there's, there's a number of links that jump out straight away. That all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all man, all men as every man had need. Well, that's exactly what happens again and is reiterated in chapter 4. That uh, verse 32, they, they that believed were of one heart and one soul, neither said any of them as all of the things they possessed was its own. They had all things common. They um, sold the things they had in verse 34 and made distribution in verse 35 according as they had need. So we have um, a series of links there. And the reason we have all of these links, and there are, there are more, that's just sort of a highlight, um, but the reason we seem to have all of these links is, is a real lesson and an exhortation for us that the ecclesia had been established in Acts chapter 2 on the back of a, a great day of preaching when everyone was infused and excited by the things they had heard and thousands were being baptised. It was a wonderful time for the ecclesia. And they set up this principle of the sharing of wealth and the, they were united in their belief and in the doctrine that they were based on. But now the ecclesia has been through a period of trial at a time when they have been challenged by those without, a time when the truth that they are trying to preach has been ridiculed and has been suppressed or has been attempted to be suppressed. And what's their reaction to that? Well, we've already seen their initial reaction to oppose those that are, are trying to suppress the truth, then to approach God in prayer, and then importantly and fundamentally, they get the ecclesia together and they re-establish exactly those principles on which the ecclesia was established in the first place. And those principles are based around two things. The belief and the truth that they know that they have um, and, and the certainty they have in God's word and um, that word that they are able to speak. And it's the love and the care for the ecclesia, the, the unity that they have, the fellowship that they have, in that they didn't consider any of their material wealth to be their own, but they gave it freely, willingly, to any that had need. And I think that's a, a, a wonderful exhortation for us to take, that when we, as individuals, as ecclesias, um, as, as the Christadelphians in general, as we face challenges from within and from without, then this is a pattern for us to follow, to, to get through those challenges, to stay firm to the truth and not allow any to, to divert us from it, to approach God in prayer and to then re-establish the principles on which the ecclesia is founded. Um, that, that we've just seen there. And it's important to understand that um, when we come to Ananias and Sapphira and, and the actions that they take. But before we get there, um, there's a line at the bottom of this slide that says Solomon's porch. Um, and this is, this is um, another comparison that we want to draw out. This, this leads us towards uh, another comparison because Solomon's porch is only mentioned, as far as I can tell, only three times in the New Testament. And, and two of the occasions are here within a couple of chapters. We have it in chapter 3 uh, and verse 11, which is after the healing of the lame man. I said we'd come back to this, and, and, and we're coming back to it. So the healing of the lame man. So at the end of that account, when the lame man has been healed, um, and uh, Peter and John are there in, in verse 11 of chapter 3. And all the people ran together as one unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's Greatly Wondering. So all the people are gathered together in Solomon's porch at the end of his account. Why are we told that? Well, in chapter 5, at the end of the account of Ananias and Sapphira, we're told in verse 12 that by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, 
and they were all with one accord in Solomon's court. Now that seems on the surface to be a completely pointless detail that we don't need to know. But of course, no, no word is wasted. And I think what we're being led to do is compare these two accounts, especially when you consider the beginning of them. So chapter three, verse one, and I should be um, a little bit further ahead. In chapter three, verse one, uh, the start of the account of the healing of the lame man says that Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now, the fact that it was at the hour of prayer doesn't seem to add a lot to the account again. Why are we told that? Well, we've just seen that the beginning of the account of Ananias and Sapphira is a time when the ecclesia are all united together in prayer. So what we've got, it seems, is two accounts which are always next to each other, which are either side of this, this serious challenge that the Ecclesia faces, the beginning and the end of that, that serious challenge. They both start uh, with a period of prayer. They both end with everyone gathered together in Solomon's porch for some reason. So what we're being led to do, it seems, is to compare these two accounts. What have we got in the middle? And what we have is a contrast, a really strong contrast, that will demonstrate... Um, the issue that Ananias and Sapphira had, the, the problem that caused them to go so badly wrong. And the way this contrast is brought out is through the use of a particular word. There's a play on this word for certain between the two accounts. It's a fairly common word. It comes up about 400 and 40 odd times, I think, in the New Testament. It's a common word, but, it, but it's particularly condensed in these couple of accounts. And I'll just demonstrate what I mean. Chapter 3, verse 2, we are introduced to a certain man lame from his mother's womb, who was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So we have a certain man. And that, that word is just there, it seems, to, to draw out this contrast. And this man is a, a cripple who is forced to beg to survive. He has nothing of his own. Um, and he relies entirely on the generosity of others to, to carry him to where he needs to be, to give arms for him to survive. He has nothing of his own. By contrast, in chapter 5 and verse 1, we are introduced to a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, who sold the possession and kept that part of the price, brought a certain part, and we'll come back to this in a moment, laid it at the apostles' feet. And so this man is well-blessed. He is wealthy. He has possessions that he can sell. He has the ability to keep some of that, to give a little bit as, as he as he feels he, he might be able to, he's well off. He can survive comfortably with the um, situation that he lives in. And in fact, his name means um, to whom Yahweh has, to whom Yahweh has given, has graciously given, or, or something along those lines. That it's someone who has been well blessed and provided for uh, by God. And so these two are, these two men are set against each other as a contrast. And then this word uh, comes up again in each of the camps. And this is where the contrast really is drawn out. So we've had two men, and this lame man in cha uh, chapter 3 and verse 3, he sees Peter and John about to go into the temple, so he asks alms of them, as, as he would have done everyone that was passing by him, um, I'm sure. Um, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So he was expecting that they would possibly give him a few coins, just a little bit spare, to, to help him get by, get through the day. And the word that's used there, um, the word that's used there for something is the same word, the same word for certain, certain man. He expected to receive certain, something, of them and, and the, the context there clearly shows that he wasn't expecting them to give all that they had he wasn't expecting um a lot but he was just 
expecting to receive something. As he looks up at them, um, he expected a few coins to come his way. Now this word comes up again uh, in chapter 5 and verse 2. So we can see how condensed this word usage is to bring out this contrast. That Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, kept back part of the price, his wife being privy to it, and brought a certain part. And there's our word again. They brought something and laid it at the apostles' feet. And the contrast couldn't really be clearer, could it? As the layman expect to receive much, so Ananias uh, and Sapphira with him weren't willing to give much. They brought a little something, almost a, a token gesture, it seems, to lay it at the apostles' feet, pretending that it was more than it was, pretending that it was everything that they had. And we can see the difference here, can't we, that the lame man, um, well, well the, the lame man didn't expect much, but was given much, was given healing, was healed of, of um, his uh, sickness. That Ananias and Sapphira weren't willing to give and therefore um, would not receive either. Uh, and, and the result is, is directly drawn out for us and contrasted. That, that in Acts 3, Peter said in verse 6, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately... His feet and ankle bones received strength. And by contrast, Ananias, um, Peter, again, it is that speaks to him. Ananias, verse 3, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, to keep, keep back part of the price of the land? Well, as it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the spirit. And, and he died there for what he had done. And the words of Peter, again, are, are directly contrasted, really, aren't they? Such as I have, I give thee, he says to the lame man. But um, it is words of condemnation that are given to Ananias. And so this contrast brings out for us the, the issue that, that Ananias had, and it's summarised really by that phrase, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. And Peter and John and the ecclesia as a whole were able to give so much more than money to those around them, they were able to give life and healing, not just from lameness, but from sin and death through the, the preaching of the word. But Ananias and Sapphira, as, as part of that ecclesia, were more focused on the money, on the silver and the gold, than they were on everything else that the truth could do for them. They wanted to keep back as much as they could for themselves, rather than being willing to give. And they'd missed the point, haven't they, of that context that we've just set, of the principles on which the ecclesia was established, that all things they shared together as one, they didn't count them to be their own. But Ananias and Sapphira did. They held it back. They kept it back for themselves. And they've missed that point. Uh, and, that, and that brings us on to this, this, this next comparison, really, which is just how badly they had missed the point of what the Ecclesia was trying to do. What well, Peter and John in particular, um, as it seems that the prominent characters in chapter four, what they were trying to establish, the, the, the attitude and the, the the principles that, that the Ecclesia was to adhere to, and how badly Ananias and Sapphira had not just ignored them, but twisted them for their own benefit. And that's the way it's presented in the words that are used. So we'll just pick out some of the, the textual links that, that demonstrate this point. Uh, Acts 4, verse 31, we, we've read all these verses. And then we'll just pick out the, these specific links. So in the middle of the verse, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Ecclesia, so that they could preach the word, so that they could bring help to those around them. Verse 3 of chapter 5, Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So not only had they not followed after well, not only had they not been filled with the Holy Spirit and followed after that which it was trying to achieve, 
They were, in fact, directly opposing it by being filled with Satan, the adversary, um, that, that caused them to lie. Um, in Acts 4, verse 31, they preach the word, they speak the word with boldness. It says at the end of verse 31, and yes, by the end of the account of Ananias and Sapphira, great fear, verse 11, has come upon all the ecclesia and upon as many as heard these things. The, the heart is drawn out, and this, I think, is the, 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 the crux of Ananias and Sapphira's problem, I think. In verse 32 of Acts 4, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. They were united in their purpose. In their, in their aims for what they were trying to achieve within the Ecclesia. But what of Ananias? Well, that, that phrase again, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And again in verse 4, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart that has not lied unto men but unto God? And again, rather than being part of that united ecclesial purpose, Rather than being part of that one heart and that one soul and that one accord that's emphasised so strongly in the early chapters of Acts, their heart was filled with Satan, the adversary. That they were going to oppose what the Ecclesia was trying to do. They were going to lie not only to men but to God. And this this principle is where the issue comes from. I just want to dwell on this for, for a few moments. Um, we, we know, don't we, from other parts of Scripture, that the heart is, is the centre of, of motive, of purpose and focus that drives individuals' actions. Um, Matthew 6, verse 21 comes to mind. For, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's the issue that, that these two individuals, that these two disciples as, as they are presented as they appear to be this is the issue that they faced their treasure was earthly wealth was earthly riches their treasure was being well respected as, as men and women as, as human beings they wanted the ecclesia to look at them and think how great are they bringing all of that money when in fact their treasure should have been the heavenly things of the well-being of the Ecclesia, the, the love and the care for their brothers and sisters, for the preaching of God's word. And as a result of this wrong attitude, their, their actions demonstrate all that they had got wrong. And this is not a new idea or problem. We're not going to look at it in detail, but, but it's, it's throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. What, one example is, is in Malachi, when the, the priesthood are condemned for something that is, is very similar, in fact. Um, and the priesthood and the people in general, they're condemned because they, they're called deceivers, because they, they had in their flocks a male um, without blemish. And they came to present a sacrifice and an offering to God, and they pretended that it was the best they had, but they hadn't brought the best of their flock. They had brought the sick, the weak, the lame. A corrupt thing, it says. And that their exhortation to them is to lay God's words to heart, to give glory to his name and to lay it to heart because their heart was not right. And this is the problem that Ananias and Sapphira faced. That they were pretending to bring more than they had. If, if they, the, the irony is, I suppose, that if they brought the amount of money that they did and said, actually, we, we'd like to keep that part of it for ourselves because of X, Y, and Z. And that probably wouldn't have been a massive problem. Be, but it's the fact that they tried to deceive, they tried to pretend they were doing more than they were. And God condemns the people in Malachi's day, and he, he will condemn Ananias and Sapphira here, because they were more interested in what man thought of them and what God thought of them. And that's why I emphasise Peter and John's response to the elders of the day in verse 19 of Acts 4, because in, in, in the context of this passage, 
the ecclesia has just been shown and been led in this wonderful example that Peter and John have shown that the sight of God is what matters. And we will not respect what, what man says unless it is based on what God says. And we do not respect what man sees unless it is based on what God sees. But Ananias and Sapphira have not understood that. They don't get it. And so they think they can deceive God himself. And of course, they cannot. So to continue, uh, bringing out the contrast um, between what they should have been like and what they in fact did. Um, verse 32 of Acts 4 tells us that none of them that, that had any possessions considered them to be their own. And that, that, that in itself is a great challenge, I think, and an exhortation for us about um, what, what we have in this life. Do we consider it to be our own or do we simply consider it to be a resource that can be used in the ecclesia's benefit or to serve others or to serve God? But, but by contrast, Ananias and Sapphira, what Peter, when speaking to Ananias, says that it was thine own and it was in thine own power. And clearly they had misunderstood um, and completely ignored that principle. He twisted it to their own use. Uh, the, the multitude were gathered together with one accord, but they're not. Um, one heart and one soul, they were all together. And Ananias and Sapphira were also together in verse 9, but uh, chapter 5, but they have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord, speaking to Sapphira on that occasion. Um, but there is power mentioned, and these are simply textual links. The, the, the links um, go, go far deeper than just the text. Um, it's the principle that they are breaking. But, but with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But, but Ananias didn't want that kind of power. He had power over his wealth in verse 4. Um, great uh, grace was upon them in verse 33. But um, great fear came because of what Ananias and Sapphira did. Uh, the apostles and the ecclesia were willing to give all. And I kept back. Um, we're not going to consider this one in detail. This is just something that I've pondered. Um, there's an interesting use of the idea of feet, which I don't understand yet, to be honest. Um, the the uh, wealth is laid at the apostles' feet. And then we have um, in verse 9 of chapter 5, the feet of them which are buried thy husband are at the door which shall carry the ass. So again, it seems a slightly odd detail to include, but I've not quite got to the bottom of what. Uh, and we don't just have the bad example of what Ananias and Sapphira did. What we also have is, is what they should have done. It's a better example of how they should have been. And, and what we seem to have in these three chapters, chapter four, five, and six, when we come to Stephen, is uh, effectively in chapter four, we have the ecclesia established on these principles. In chapter five, we have the worst example of those principles being broken and twisted and misused for an individual's benefit. And then in the example of Stephen, we have those principles being outworked in a faithful brother who um, was willing to give all. And so it, almost each one of these particular links and, and the ideas are brought out again in Acts chapter 6 and 7. So in Acts chapter 6, first of all, we have to establish that the, the context is very similar. Exactly the same process is, is, is going on. There's another issue now. There's another challenge that arises within the ecclesia, this time from within. So Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there's our first repeated theme that we've had in every account so far. Chapter 2, chapter 4, now chapter 6. When the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. But so the issue that arises is around the idea of the daily ministration. Now, this was um, a, a form, a, a structured form of what the apostles had instigated in Acts chapter 2 and repeated in Acts chapter 4 of this idea of sharing of wealth. 
And this was the, it was almost a central fund. It was their collections, if you like. Um, that those that were able to give would give, and then it was distributed uh, according as any had need. And, and here it, it's referred to as the widows that were neglected, those that had no means to support themselves financially. And, and that's the, the uh, topic for discussion. It's exactly what's been established in chapter four. So it's the same concept. Ananias and Sapphira were bringing money to the apostles. This donor administration was, was part of that process. And the issue was that the Greeks, uh, well, the, the Gentiles believed that the um, Jewish widows were being favoured and, and the, the Gentile widows were being neglected and that there was an imbalance there and there was favouritism and, and, uh, and all sorts. So we're in the same sort of context. Then the 12, verse 2, called the multitude of the disciples to them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God. Here we go again. That's the second fundamental pillar of the ecclesia that's been established twice, chapter 2 and chapter 4. It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So, so what's happening here? Well, what's happened is that there's an issue that the Ecclesia faces. It's brought to the apostles, to the elders in the Ecclesia, and their response is once again threefold. Firstly, they will continue to preach the word of God. It's not reason that we should leave the word of God. We have to continue with that work. They will give themselves continually to prayer, they said there in verse 4. And also, they're going to set people over this task of making sure that the ecclesia is cared for equally and fairly, and that none are left out or neglected. Exactly the same process as we've seen in chapter 4. An issue arises, and they continue to do the will of God, they approach God in prayer, and they continue to care for the ecclesia. Now, the man that they choose to, or one of the men that they choose to do this, of course, is Stephen, verse 5. They're saying, pleased the whole multitude. That's, that's another aspect of this that's very important, that they're all involved in this. They're all united in this. The whole multitude is pleased with what's going on. They are united in their belief and in their care for each other. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So let's start to fill in our table. Stephen is a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what we saw was the case in chapter 4. If we continue reading um, down, so uh, we, we have then the list of the other uh, men that were chosen in verse, verse 5. Um, they laid their hands on them in verse 6, which is, um, again, the passing on of the, the, the Holy Spirit gift. Yeah. Um, and we come down to verse 9 and 10. And Stephen is not only undertaking this role, but what else is he doing? Well, there were those certain of the synagogue um, disputing with Stephen. In verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So he was not only undertaking the care of the ecclesia, but he was also preaching the word, and he was speaking boldly. It doesn't use that word, but he was speaking boldly. He was not scared, he was not fearful of preaching, um, and he was preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit, um, as was the case back in chapter 4. They were all together, they were united, as we just uh, drawn out. They were whole, The whole multitude was pleased with what they were doing. Um, verse 8, Stephen was full of faith and power. He did wonders and miracles, and we saw wonders and signs earlier, didn't we? Um, the, the table is, is not complete. It's just to give a flavour of these ideas that are coming out. Um, the great um, uh, wonders and miracles that he's doing, again, just a, a textual link there. And Stephen, of course, was not only willing to give financially or... or, or um, material things but of course at the end of chapter 7 he gave his entire life to 
the service of the truth, to the service of God, to the service of the ecclesia. In contrast with Ananias and Sapphira, who were unwilling to give. Um, and again, we have this, this contrast brought out, which I haven't got my head around, but um, just as the, the disciple of the ecclesia was to bring gifts and lay them at the apostles' feet, the um, clothes of those that stoned Stephen were laid down at the feet of Saul. Slightly unusual sort of uh, contrast, but, but it's there anyway. So, so we have this direct contrast again of Ananias and Sapphira twisting the purpose of the Ecclesia to suit themselves, to benefit themselves instead of having the Ecclesia and the care of their brothers and sisters at the centre of their thinking. But Stephen is the example that we should aim to emulate, to follow in this way. And there's a danger and a warning there again for us, isn't there? That there will always be opportunity for those that want to to use the ecclesia for their own benefit, to, to boost their own ego, or to, to gain in, in some way, whatever it is, um, to, to put themselves at the centre. And that's the mistake Ananias and Sapphira made, that they didn't have the will of God at the centre of their thinking. They didn't have the good of the ecclesia at the centre of their thinking. And they were punished for it. And although we may not face the immediate punishment that Ananias and Sapphira do, if we have that same attitude, ultimately the same punishment lies in wait for us. But, but equally, Stephen, as, as someone who manifested the correct characteristics, who truly was faithful until the very end, he um, has his hope and will be raised at the last day. And so that hope. Uh, remains for us also. So now we just want to pick out um, a couple of little details from, from the narrative itself. So we've seen we've seen these contrasts and how this fits so neatly where it does in the book of Acts, with the ecclesia having been established on the foundation of Acts chapter two, with the challenge that the ecclesia has been through, with the the statement of Peter and John that they should not be interested in what man sees. And Ananias and Sapphira have ignored it all um, and turned away. And, and this is brought out again with this, this reference to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5. Ananias' focus had been on man. He wanted to look good in the sight of man. But Peter very quickly points out in verse 3, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep that part of the price of the land? And at the end of verse 4, you have lied unto God. You have lied to men, but more importantly, you've lied to God. And, and the, the exhortation speaks for itself, doesn't it? We, we cannot hide from God. We cannot hide anything from God. And we read in Mark 3 that, that denying the power of the Holy Spirit um, denying God's power to, to see all things, God's power to forgive, God's power to save, that cannot be forgiven unless it is truly repented from and, and one recognises that, that, um, that they were wrong to think that. But Ananias here does not repent. Ananias brings this to the, the apostles, believing that he can deceive God, believing that he can get away with it, believing that God doesn't have the power to see what he is doing. And so his punishment is swift and, um, and lasting. Sapphira, though, is slightly different. Sapphira is given a second chance, and we ask why. Um, if we come down to verse 7, it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. She was given an opportunity to turn back. She was given an opportunity to confess, to repent for what had been done, because she had not been with Ananias in the first place. Because she hadn't been there when Ananias had lied to God blatantly in the presence of all, she is given the opportunity to, to confess to what has been done. But 
when she refuses to do so, when she says, yay, it was for so much, she too is punished in exactly the same way. And we see here the mercy of God, don't we? That God is not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3 says, but that all should come to repentance. And so that way to repentance is, is presented. So far, we didn't take it. Um, we must ensure that when we are in the wrong, we have that opportunity. When we take that opportunity, that, that God will always present. Now, I've got uh, a few minutes left, I think, haven't I? So, so hopefully that's given... Uh, uh, hopefully that's been an interesting look at how this account sits in act, some, some details that have come out, some, hopefully some uh, good exhortation um, for us all. What, what I'd like to do just for the last couple of minutes um, is to consider um, uh, effectively a couple of questions that I've still got really about this account, the details that, that, that are added. That I'm not sure why yet. I've got a suggestion, though, and so I'll try and present this quickly um, to just see um, if it's got, if it makes any sort of sense. Um, so the questions I've got. Firstly, at the end of Acts chapter 4, we read from verse, um, middle of verse 34, as many as were possessed of lands or houses, sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them down on the apostles' feet, and distribution was made accordingly. Then we're told, verse 36, that Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted as son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, all that does is repeat exactly what's already been said. Having land, um, he had land, he sold it, he brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's already been said in verses 34 and 35. So why are we given this example? And why specifically are we given the example of Barnabas? That's one question. And the other question in verse 7 of chapter 5 is that it was the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Why, why three hours? Why doesn't it say just that it came to pass that his wife, not knowing what was done, came in? Why are we given the time period? So two questions. Um, and I, I think I've got a suggestion that these two answers m might be linked. And I think these are pointing us to yet another link with another part of Acts. This is Acts chapter 9 this time. So come to Acts chapter 9. Um, this will probably seem really tenuous to start with. Um, so just bear with me. Um, it might even seem really tenuous by the end, but um, I'm going to say it anyway. So in Acts chapter 9, this is the account of Saul being converted. Um, so we just need to set some of the, the context um, of why these passages might be linked. Um, verse 26, so after the conversion has happened, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Okay, so we've got Barnabas taking something, bringing it to the apostles. That's what we have in Acts chapter 4. It, just bear with me. Um, then, at the end of verse 27, he, he tells the apostles how he'd seen the Lord in the way and that he'd spoken to him and how Saul had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. He preached boldly. Now, that, that's the, the word we had in Acts chapter 4. Um, that they asked for strength to speak boldly, and then they did speak boldly in Acts chapter 4. Now, interestingly, that word hasn't been used since then. It's used relatively regularly for disciples, apostles, um, speaking boldly. Uh, it's used fairly regularly, but it's not used between the end of Acts 4 and here in Acts chapter 9, until Saul is born. Okay, so what we've got then it seems, is that the fear that came on the Ecclesia after the incident with Ananias and Sapphira, and although the preaching continued, the way it's being presented is that that fear that came upon the Ecclesia prevented this bold speaking continuing in, in some way. 
But Barnabas is at the beginning and end of that period bringing something to the ecclesia. And this time he's bringing Saul um, as, as the solution, really, to that problem. We're having to run through this really quickly, which is, which is a shame, because I think it's really interesting. Um, but the thing that I think strengthens this ever so slightly is that who is it that comes to Saul in between? Well, in verse 10 of Acts chapter 9, we are introduced to a certain disciple. Now, that's the word certain we had earlier. Um, a certain man named Ananias. And now we've got a certain disciple named Ananias who comes to Saul. And so what we seem to be presented with is Ananias, the man who at the very time that the Ecclesia should have been bringing everything that they had, he was the man who stopped that, prevented it, and that caused a serious issue within the Ecclesia. Now a man named Ananias converts a man called Saul, who was able to bring that bold preaching back to the Ecclesia, and it's Barnabas that brings him back. Just as Barnabas was the man who brought, was the example of what Ananias should have done. I have to explain that really quickly. Hopefully it makes some kind of sense, and we'll, we'll strengthen it again a little further. Um, but the exhortation is the same either way. Whether or not that link makes any sense, Barnabas is the man bringing something on every occasion. And that is an example and an exhortation in itself, whether it's financial, material wealth, whether it's a new soul to bring into the creature Barnabas is bringing. Now, to answer the second question, why three hours? Well, in Acts chapter 9, um, I'm just going to put all these on the screen so you can sort of see where we're going with it. The, the two things are kind of parallel. Acts chapter 9, verse 4, fall, fell to the earth. Just as Ananias fell down in Acts chapter 5, verse 5. After Ananias fell down, there was a period of three hours when Sapphira did not know what had happened. She was in the dark, to use um, uh, a phrase. What happened after uh, Saul uh, fell down? Well, in verse 9, he was three days without sight, with neither meat nor drink. And so it was sort of a symbolic death, really, that for three days he was um, symbolically dead without sight. And for three hours, Sapphira didn't know what had happened. And at the end of that period, they're both given a second chance to repent from the sin that they've been committing. And the, the contrast that we have is that Saul spent those three days in prayer to God. Sapphira didn't, and she continued with, with her sin. Um, and the, the result then is, of course, directly contrasted that, that Sapphira fell down and, and Saul, in verse 18, arose and is healed um, from his blindness. Maybe that makes some kind of sense. I wish I had a few more minutes to actually explain that properly. Um, but, but even if not, it's, it's an interesting uh, parallel to consider. So to draw our thoughts to a close then, We've seen in Ananias and Sapphira a story of two people who allowed their love of earthly wealth and status outgrow their love for their brethren and sister. And that, I think, is the, the big lesson that we can take away from this. Which is stronger? Our love for the things that we have in this life or our love for our brothers and sisters, for the ecclesia, for the preaching of the word, for, for God's will to be done on this earth? And we summarised on the screen now that the, the lessons that we've, that we've um, considered during this talk, the, the setting our hearts on heavenly things, the dangers of, of coveting God's, uh, the, the denial of God's power um, never being possible and God always providing us with a second chance. So let's take the positive examples that we've seen, of Peter and John and, and Stephen and, and others, and let's never fall into the, the trap that Ananias and Sapphira did. Um, that we might always value the, the status of the ecclesia, the well-being of the ecclesia, above the uh, selfish and um, the wealth-focused mistakes that Ananias and Sapphira made. Mm -hmm.